Hello, task force members and members of the public. It is now 101. Um, I will call on Parliamentarian Johnson, who will then call uh, for Ms. Belton so that we can establish a quorum to proceed with the rest of the hearing today. Thank you. Parliamentarian Johnson. Yes, can you, oh, you couldn't hear me, I'm sorry. I was just saying, um, I wanted to make sure you received the notice regarding the first witness, that he would not be able to testify until 1.40. Oh, no, I didn't receive that, but. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure yes, I just received the text. Yes, um, Attorney Belton, can you please call the roll to establish uh, a, a quorum? Uh, thank you, Chair Moore and Parliamentarian Johnson. We will now go down the list that the task force members indicate their presence. Chair Moore? Present. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Present. Senator Stephen Bradford? Senator Stephen Bradford. Dr. Cheryl Grill. Present. Lisa Holder. Present. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer. Present. Dr. Devon Scott Lewis. Present. John Tamaki. Uh, present. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Stepp. Here. Madam Chair, there are nine members of the task force and five members are needed for quorum. There are eight members of the task force currently present. A quorum has been reestablished. Thank you very much, Ms. Belton. Um, really quickly before we get into our, our next panel, Parliamentarian Johnson, I have yet to receive an email or text message. Can you clarify uh, which yes. uh, witness you're referencing? Yes, of course. Um, I just received a message that the witness at one o'clock, Mr. Dean, that's Terrence Dean, is unable to testify until 1.40. Okay. And Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. So without further ado, we'll um, uh, reorder the schedule of our panelists and we will move Terrence Dean towards the um, end of the panel. <clears throat> so I would like to take this moment to remind each witness panel that their testimony is recorded, live streamed, and will be available to the public. And this panel on uh, the racial wealth gap will run from one o'clock to 220. So the first expert witness we will hear from today regarding the racial wealth gap is Professor Thomas Kramer, who will have 15 minutes to speak. Dr. Thomas Kramer is an associate professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of Connecticut. He has conducted numerous studies on the psychology of race and has written numerous papers on reparations for slavery. Then we will hear from Kavan Ward, Kavan Ward is the founder of Justice for Bruce Beach and the co-founder of Where Is My Land. Kavan is a PhD student at Antioch University and an award-winning spoken word artist. Then we will hear from Paul Austin. Paul Austin is a resident of Marin City and the founder and CEO of Play Marin, a nonprofit dedicated to providing adequate access to extracurricular and athletic opportunity in, Mar in Marin City. Then we will hear from Dr. Terrence Dean. Terrence Dean is a professor of Black Studies at Denison University in Ohio. Mr. Dean was formerly an MTV executive and is the author of numerous books. Professor Dean will speak on the town of Allensworth, which was the first town in California that was completely controlled and financed by Black Americans. 
And then Paul Austin will speak to his personal experience with his, his and his wife, Tanisha Austin, um, and the discrimination they faced in the home appraisal uh, system. Without further ado, I would like to extend um, the microphone uh, to Thomas Kramer. Uh, Professor Kramer, you may uh, begin your expert testimony when you are available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the task force for their inspiring work and for allowing me to testify. I prepared a little slide presentation titled The Wealth Gap and Lost Wages Due to Slavery. Is that uh, slideshow available? Okay, I, um, ca can you see it on the screen? Yes, yes. all right, yeah. Th thank you. Um, if you could put on the next slide, please. Please forward the slide. Okay, um, this is what I will be speaking about and I will address my personal motivation for the research at the end. Next slide, please. I will first introduce myself. Next slide. My name is Thomas Kramer. I'm an associate professor at the University of Connecticut's Department of Public Policy. I obtained a political science doctorate in 2001 from the University of Tübingen in my native Germany and a PhD from Stony Brook University in New York in 2005. My research focuses on implicit and explicit racial attitudes in the United States and how they influence people's opinions on race-related policies, including slavery reparation. Next slide, please. I was asked to testify about the black-white wealth gap and its likely origin in the historical injustices of slavery and post-slavery de jure anti-black racial discrimination. Next slide. William Darity and Kirsten Mullen in their book, From Here to Equality, write, next slide. We, we view the racial wealth gap as the most robust indicator of the cumulative economic effects of white supremacy in the United States. So that includes slavery and post-slavery discrimination. Next slide, please. I use average household net worth figures provided by Buta et al. for the year 2019 to compute the per capita black-white wealth gap. I will explain in a moment why I use average rather than median net worth figures. The gap in average household wealth in 2019 amounted to $840,900. Next slide, please. Then I divided each group's average household wealth figure by the average household size in 2019 based on U.S. census figures. Next slide, please. And arrived at an average per capita wealth gap of $358,293. Next slide. In other words, if the goal of reparations to African-American descendants of the enslaved in the U.S. is the elimination of the wealth gap, net reparations would have to amount to at least $358,293 per eligible respond, uh, recipient. I cannot know ahead of time how many people will be eligible, and eligibility criteria may be in flux for a while. So I'm using readily available numbers from the U.S. Census to estimate the number of African-American descendants of the enslaved in the U.S. I take the number of non-Hispanic Blacks or African-Americans in the U.S. Bureau of the Census's count, which in 2019 amounted to approximately 41 million individuals. This will inevitably include some Black people without enslaved ancestors in the U.S., but it may miss some other uh, some otherwise eligible individuals as well. So this is a very rough estimate. With this estimate, an amount of roughly $14.7 trillion would be sufficient to close the average per capita black-white wealth gap in one fell swoop. Next slide, please. While this is technically possible, it would be very difficult for an individual state like California to provide that kind of reparations. For example, if California were to pay the roughly estimated 2 million black non-Hispanic descendants of the enslaved in the U.S., again, a rough estimate of elig eligible recipients that lived in the state in 2019, that amount in reparations, it would spend $778.6 billion in 2019 dollars. 
However, the state's budget in 2019 was only, and I use only in quotation marks, $215 billion, nowhere near enough to cover the expenses. Instead, California could exert pressure on the federal government to provide federal level reparations. After all, it was the federal government that allowed slavery to exist in the United States. Thus, it would be proper for the federal government to provide reparation. Next slide. So why not take the lower median per capita wealth gap, which could be closed with a reparations budget of only, and again only in quotation marks, $2.87 trillion in 2019 dollars. The median is a statistical procedure to produce the typical amount of wealth in a population unaffected by some very rich outliers. Given that slave owners tended to be rich outliers among whites, and by extension their heirs today, we would miss all of these estates if we went by the statistical procedure of the median. The mean better represents the entire contribution, rich as well as poor, in each group. Next slide. Another reason that I would opt for the larger average wealth gap as a basis for reparations rather than the smaller median wealth gap is that losses in wages to African-American enslaved alone can account for the current average per capita wealth gap based on a rough a back of the envelope calculation. The calculation only considers withheld wages during the period of slavery in the United States, not colonial slavery, and it does not consider post-slavery anti-black racial discrimination, not because this is not important, but because further research would be required. Next slide. What is required for the back of the envelope calculation is an estimate of the enslaved population in each year from 1776 to 1860. Numbers for the Civil War years are too unreliable to estimate. To keep my calculation conservative, I'm therefore ignoring them. Next slide, please. The US Bureau of the Census provides counts of the enslaved population in each decade from 1790 to 1860. To estimate the enslaved population between decennial censuses, I use linear interpolation, and for the years before 1790, linear extrapolation. More sophisticated methods can be used, but I'm, but, but I'm going with the simplest one, and the results are not that different. Next slide, please. Then I turn to Officer and Williamson's historical records of unskilled hourly wages in nominal dollars in the years 1790 to 1860 which again are very conservative as many of the enslaved were in fact skilled. In fact, they were often selected for their skills. I use an estimation procedure for the years before 1790. I should mention that the hourly wages are incredibly small. In 1790, the average hourly wage for an unskilled laborer amounted to two cents, and by 1860, it had risen to eight cents per hour. This is another feature that makes my back of the envelope calculation extremely conservative. Now I turn to the question, how many hours the enslaved lost through enslavement? Enslavement was for life, and it was heritable from generation to generation. This meant that the enslaved had no control over how to spend their time in the free labor market sense. They lost control over all 24 hours of the day. Slave owners benefited from this enslaved only during the time the enslaved were performing field work for cash crop production, because that yielded products that could be exchanged for money on a market. However, the enslaved produced many services that were not exchanged for money on a market, from draining the fields, building and maintaining plantations, to producing clothing, cooking food, raising their own and the slave owner's children, and so on. That work often lasted into the night. Sleep was granted by the slave owner based on his or her own self-interest considerations, not the interests of the enslaved. The question, therefore, is what would a slave owner have had to pay free laborers on the labor market to be on call for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Economists like to deduct from this amount time for sleep as well as the cost for food and shelter. But based on basic assumptions of market economics, this is, in my view, wrong-headed. It would only make sense if the enslaved had been part of the negotiations, but they were not. The price of an enslaved person was negotiated between two slave owners, never including the voice of the enslaved. Food and shelter remained the property of the slave owner, even when it was consumed by the enslaved. Next slide, please. Um, 
did I miss a slide? Um, Oh, could you, yeah, if you could go further, I, I I think I missed one instruction. If you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is an excerpt from my Excel spreadsheet, which is cut off in 1794, but continues to 1860 and compounds the amount up to the present time. So the next step in my computation is to take the number of enslaved in the United States in each year times 24 hours a day, times 365 days a year, times the puny historical hourly wage, and add a moderate interest rate to the total to reflect non-payment. In my example, I'm using only 3% interest, which is unlikely to be enough to make up for inflation. It's a very conservative amount. More realistic would be 6%, the amount of interest specified, for example, in the sales contract of Georgetown University when it sold 272 enslaved in 1838 to save the institution from financial ruin. Next slide, please. But I'm going with a much more conservative interest rate of 3%. With that, I arrive at a 2019 estimate of $19.14 trillion. Next slide, please. I should mention that merely doubling the interest rate to the more realistic 6% would exponentially blow up the total estimates to 6.6 .6 quadrillion 2019 dollars. Next slide, please. Thus, the interest rate will be the most important figure to negotiate between the descendant community and the federal government should such negotiations begin in earnest. Next slide. So let me stick with a 3% compound interest estimate of $19.14 trillion. Next slide. Now the average amount of reparations owed per U.S. resident can be estimated by using the U.S. Bureau of the Census's count of the 2019 U.S. population, which included approximately 328 million individuals. This includes everyone who at least indirectly benefits from the startup capital that slavery provided to the U.S. economy today. It includes first-generation immigrants like myself, as well as African-American descendants of the enslaved, as well as everybody else. Each U.S. resident would owe on average $58,302. African-American descendants of the enslaved in the U.S. would receive reparations in a larger amount, and the net amount, if you subtract that, um, that $58,000, would be $406,785 per eligible recipient in 2019 dollars. This means that wage-based reparations at only 3% interest would comfortably close the 2019 average per capita black-white wealth gap of $358,293. Next slide. Of course, this only addresses losses due to withheld wages during U.S. slavery and thus lost inheritances. What is missing is colonial slavery as well as post-slavery de jure anti-black racial discrimination. And missing, according to Professor Swinton's proposed comprehensive formulas, are lost freedom during colonial and U.S. slavery, as well as lost opportunities to acquire capital, as well as pain and suffering during all these time periods. Next slide. Thus, in conclusion, the average per capita, and uh, yeah, next slide, sorry. Um, the average per capita black-white wealth gap should be considered a minimum amount of reparations to restore a status of fairness. Next slide. Slavery produced the startup capital for the rise of the U.S. economy at the exclusive expense of the African Americans who were enslaved. Their descendants deserve recognition of this fact through a comprehensive federal reparations program. Next slide. Whatever California can do to support the call for federal reparations to the African-American descendants of the enslaved in the U.S. will be an exercise in the restoration of justice. Next slide, please. I will close my statement with a personal motivation for my research. Next slide. My interest in the question of race, racism, and reconciliation is based on my experience of growing up in Germany. Next slide and learning about the Holocaust in every high school subject, I felt ashamed of our German history and always dreamed of being able to express to a Holocaust survivor how I felt. Of course, I never thought I would have the chance. Next slide. One day, though, I met Mietzsche Langer, a survivor of five concentration camps and a death march in his youth. 
He and his wife had just retired from Israel to my hometown of Tübingen, Germany, of all places. Next slide. I was amazed at how this man, who had suffered so much at German hands, was able to trust in younger Germans like myself and in Germany as a country after all that he had suffered in his youth. Next slide. I learned later that he had received a reparations pension of about $2,000 a month from the 1970s all the way to 2015 when he unfortunately passed away. Over a period of roughly 45 years, this would amount to a little over $1 million, an amount, of course, that is merely symbolic as it could not possibly compensate for all that Miechu had suffered. He lost his entire larger family and barely survived himself. Next slide, please. The purpose of, reparations, of the reparations pension was to serve as a material token of sincerity, giving way to German promises to never let it happen again. And I think this is all that reparations can be, a symbolic gesture giving weight and credibility to words of apology for historical injustices. Next slide. And with that, I say thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. Uh, for that informative expert uh, testimony and for also invoking some of your personal story um, at the end of your presentation. Thank you for that. And uh, now I would like to turn it to Kavan Ward. Um, Kavan Ward, you have 20 minutes and you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you? Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Kavan Ward and I am founder of Justice for Bruce's Beach and co-founder of Where's My Land. I'm also an activist and a poet. Justice for Bruce's Beach is a grassroots organization and it was created to obtain land restoration and restitution for the Bruce family. Justice for Bruce's Beach gave birth to Where Is My Land, a national organization founded by myself and Ashanti Martin to help Black families reclaim stolen land through advocacy, research, and technology. Bruce's Beach has set a precedent as it is the first time in U.S. history that land stolen from Black Americans has been returned. Since Governor Newsom signed SB 796, a bill introduced by Senator Bradford to allow for the transfer of the land from Los Angeles County to the Bruce family descendants, Whereas my land has had an influx of families from around the nation asking us to aid them in their endeavors to get back stolen land for, from their ancestors, land stolen from their ancestors. While I am grateful the land is being returned to the Bruce family, the city of Manhattan Beach still has a debt to pay to the Bruces. The city of Manhattan Beach owes the Bruce family restitution for violating their civil and human rights and for stripping them of the opportunity to pass down generational wealth. Perhaps one way for this task force to consider closing the wealth gap is by supporting and providing resources to organizations like Where Is My Land and an effort to aid other Black families in California, such as the Prelos, and reclaiming their stolen land. I could sit here and define reparations and regurgitate facts about how marginalized Black people are are and how black land theft has contributed immensely to the loss of generational wealth and the wealth gap between whites and black people. And I can sit here and rebut arguments made by white people around why they shouldn't pay for the sins of their ancestors. But I won't because we've heard speaker after speaker do that. They've already made solid and compelling arguments for reparation. But what I will argue, what I will urge you members of the task force to consider is the possibility of tiering reparations so that every one of the African diaspora in California gets them, not just descendants of Africans who were enslaved and brought here. I ask for this consideration because all black people in America are impacted by white supremacy and deal with everyday racism and racial battle fatigue. When LAPD pulls over a Black person, they don't treat Haitians or Jamaicans any less harshly than they treat African Americans. When I was asked to testify before this task force, I was asked to talk about why I believe reparations are important, who I propose reparations be paid to, and what I think reparations should be paid for. The best way for me as a poet to answer the what question is through poetry. So I'd like to close with this reparations piece I created. 
As ta Coates said, America begins in black plunder and white democracy. Two features that are not contradictory, but complementary. Every whip slash inflicted on their backs ironically gave them strength to carry on their shoulders the burden of trickery, treachery, and conformity. Let's not forget the burden of you dismantling the black family and using black babies to breed human machinery. Machinery used to provide centuries of privilege and stability for you and your offsprings. And as I write this piece, my hand chokes pen angrily and the red ink from it bleeds, reminding me of the 1920s, Bruce's Beach and Black Wall Street, reminding me of decade after decade of your people consistently stealing from me. You keep telling me and my people to get over it, but how can we when the consequences still exist and when your grandfather's clock of wealth, it continues to tick? As long as you keep benefiting from my people's timeless misfortunes, you should never fix your expectations for me to forget. I won't get over this. America is in debt. They run up a bill on their black card and now it's time for them to pay what's rightfully ours. No more committing identity fraud. And if you refuse to pay me monetarily, at the very least pay me for the respect your ancestors stole from mine during slavery when you forced her to breastfeed your babies but refused to nourish her body with the very foods she prepared for you and your family. The balance won't disappear. It'll only accrue more interest until you take serious our interest and make payments. Pay us reparations for our separation, separation from our property, our family, our dignity, and our liberty, separation from our mother's land, the motherland, during slavery. Pay me because you steadily deprived me of everything I worked hard for and earned. Pay me because your sweet little Becky can get a job, boy, a college degree, and still be paid more than me, even though I obtained a master's degree. Pay me because you refused to hire me, all because my hair defies gravity. Pay me for discriminating against me because I choose to use a loctician and refuse to conform to the European standards of beauty. Pay me because you use my tax dollars to build prisons for my people and their children instead of schools with updated curricula and teachers that educate effectively. Pay me because you created a school, a prison pipeline, and you called it a remedy, when in actuality it's modern day slavery. Pay me because I have to prepare my child to expect police brutality and to expect Accept the reality that the cops can kill her and walk away scot-free. Pay me for redlining, white flight, and the red, white, and blue light signaling for me to pull over all because I'm driving while black in a white neighborhood at night. Pay us for standing on the front lines overseas to fight your war only to be assaulted for wearing an American uniform once we step back on U.S. soil. Pay me and pay me handsomely. My hand will continue to poke pen as red ink from it bleeds, reminding me of Troy Anthony Davis, Marissa Alexander, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Archie Elliott, Oscar Grant, Sandra Bland, Ahmaud Arbery, Christopher DeAndre Mitchell, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. My hand will continue to choke pen and force it to bleed until I am deceased or until this country has paid me for all they have stolen from me and for the black keloid scars they've left on humanity. Pay me. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Kavan Ward, uh, for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate it. We will now go to, the, huh, Paul, sorry, <laughs> uh, Paul Austin. Paul Austin? You may begin your testimony when you are available, when you're ready. Well, yes, thank you for having me. I'm glad that I was signed on, number one. Uh, first, I'd like to say this is a privilege um, that I have the opportunity to speak in front of you guys to talk about my personal story. Um, I would just like to go back a little bit in history. Would you like to be seeing via video? Um, just putting that out there that we can't see you via video. Don't know if that was a personal choice or not, but if you want to be seen, make sure you put your video on. One second. 
Um, can you see me now? No. Ah, uh, because the say video is working. Mm. Mm. Well, I would love to be seen, but if not, I perfectly do understand. Well, well yeah, you can just continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, um, I would just. You can continue, excuse me. Um, or you can log out and log back in again if you really want to be seen. If not, you can just continue your testimony. And I apologize for any technical um, difficulties. No problem. Can I try that real um, quickly? Yes. Out, um, and again. someone's going to help you. Uh, okay, someone you. from staff should be reaching out. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Just putting that out there. We see you now. We see. You. Okay, we're good. Yes, we're good to go. Thank you very much. And you can begin your testimony when you're ready. No problem. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Number one. Um, I'm going to start with why I'm here. Then I'll go a little bit into to history. Um, the reason why I was asked to testify, me and my wife Tanisha was because our story about our home went viral. And it went viral because um, we had an appraiser come out in 2019 to appraise our home. I was at home at the time. She was an older white woman, and she appraised our house for just underneath a million dollars. This was after we had put already 400000 an additional $400,000 into our property. Um, it wasn't the first appraisal that we got. We had got an appraisal um, a year before, before we did an additional 1,300 square feet. And the appraiser appraised our house um, for just under a million dollars. But everything else in our area, we did the we did our homework. We know it should appraise for about 1.4. So we had to fight against it. And we fought. And... The next appraiser came out and appraised our house for $500,000 more, 1.4. That's a $500,000 difference um, just because we believe um, the white lady wanted to devalue our property because we are in a black neighborhood and the home belonged to a black family. But the second appraiser, we did something different. We asked our good friend, Jan, to come out and act like she was my wife, Tanisha. We, we took down all of our black art. We took down pictures of our family. Anything that could resemble that this home belonged to a young black couple, we took it down. Jan brought over a picture of her family and she sat at our island and she acted as if she was my wife. And yes, the home was appraised for $500,000 more. Appraised for what it should have been appraised for. And for, yes, we were thankful that that happened. Just imagine if we didn't have the will or the strength to fight against the appraisal company. Now, I'd like to go back a little bit, and then I'll come back to that again. But um, my grandparents migrated from the South to work in the shipyards 
back in the 1940s. They worked in the Sausalito shipyards, which is located in Marin County. They worked in those shipyards and everybody at that time lived in governmental housing, which was located in Marin City. When the war ended around 1942, World War II ended in 1942, my grandparents had enough money, both sets, my, my dad and my mother grandparents. They both had enough money and they wanted to relocate if they had the opportunity throughout Marin. But they did not have that opportunity. Due to redlining, black people wasn't able to buy land outside of Marin City and the rest of Marin. If you look at Marin County currently, it's arguably the richest county in California. But the data shows from race count that Marin County also has the largest disparities anywhere. Education, economics, there's such a huge gap from what you see white people have and what you see the small percentage of black people have. And so yes, I do wanna see a change because I don't wanna see my children have to deal with this. I do wanna see our property value in Marin City to increase because currently it's not looked upon that as if it should increase. So I live in a county where currently our neighbor is a mile away. Their homes are valued at 1.6, 1.7. Even though it sits on the same lot, it, the home may even be smaller. We have to question ourselves and ask why is that? I know for me, I could just look directly at the county in which I live in, which is predominantly white, and look at the small pocket of that is Marin City and how Marin City have been treated constantly, how it's been ignored, how the education system has failed our children, and I mean black children. The Marin City Sausalito School District got hit with a desegregation law two years ago. The first one in over 50 years in California because a district that only has two schools in it decided to put all the black and brown kids in one school and then deprive them of what they needed. So yes, the state had to step in and stop that. This is the small city that I live in. And it's not even a city, it's actually not incorporated. There's about 3,000 people in this area and the land is very valuable. It's seven minutes away from the Golden Gate Bridge. So we are right now fighting gentrification because the land is so valuable. But then we fast forward back to my story. We wasn't looking to sell our home. We was not looking to do anything with our home, but complete the small details and build out that we are looking to do. Our home initially was 1,300 square feet. We then added in an additional 1,300 square feet. That's 2,000 square feet. And when this lady came in and looked at our home and she was, oh, I love your view. She talked about everything that we've done with it, added the fireplace, added a room downstairs for us, plus added an ADU, an apartment, one bedroom. And then for her to come back and lowball us and give us cops, the cops that she um, used for our home was so off and so wrong. She used a town home that was only like 1,100 square feet. She did use a home in a neighboring area, but the home was small, it was ran down. She called Marin City a distinct Market, marketable area. I took that as code word, as it's a black area. We have a beautiful water view of the bay. He deemed us for having a view or our house being on a hill. Something that I've never heard before when talking to other people in this business. 
But one thing that I can say is our story empowered other people to step up and really look at the practices from appraisals that has negatively affected black and brown people. It's the systems that has been created by white people for white people that continuously negatively affect people that look like me. So yes, on this day, I'm excited to be here because this can actually be something tangible to really help create change. So my daughter and my son won't have to go through the same things that me and my wife went through. If people could just imagine their home being devalued by $500,000 when all you're trying to do is make a better life for yourself, of how that makes you feel. It makes me angry. It makes me upset. There was times where I was physically so tied up that my stomach hurt, my head hurt, just because of what we went through. I don't wish that on anybody. There should be no reason why black folks should be devalued in America today. Traditionally, it has constantly happened, but now it's time for us to take those steps and right the wrongs. This is the opportunity now for us to look at reparations or damages for what has been done to the black American from the time we was brought here. We are the only race that have not had an opportunity to be given what we deserve for all that we have done here in the United States. We constantly live through trauma that's been passed down from generation to generation, but we also have been the resilient people to constantly help build and fight for America. So my story, I can directly look at my grandparents and the struggle they went through and look at the redlining issues that they had to deal with when they grew up. But for me to, cost, to also have to deal with it, 60 years later, 80 years later, it should not, cause it shouldn't constantly happen. We're in 2021 and this happened in 2019 to me. I do have one story I wanna leave with. My dad, grandparents was arguably the first black um, people to, to build a home in Mill Valley, which is a neighboring white town right next to Marin City. The story that they told me, because it took me a while to understand, they had a driveway that was a 90 degree drop. Their house was in the hills, but they had a driveway that was a 90 degree drop. You could not see the house from the road. And when I asked them why, they told me, grandson, I had to build this home at night and on weekends. So we wouldn't be detected because they didn't want any black families living in their city. And that sat with me for a long time. And while yet they had an opportunity to build that home, they had a white man who got the lumber for them. And this was in the 1950s. The lady who actually sold them the deed, she ended up getting blackballed a year later, years later, because they found out that she sold a home to a black family. And that's always sat on me since I was like 10 years old. But then you fast forward 35 years later, and then I have to go through essentially the same thing. So now is the time for folks to step up. California, do what's right. Give black people what they deserve. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much, Mr. Austin, uh, for that incredibly moving personal testimony. Um, now we would we would like to go to Dr. Terrence Dean. Terrence Dean, you may begin uh, your testimony uh, when you are ready. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Terrence Dean. I'm an assistant professor here at Denison University. The work that I do, the research that I do, um, extends to Allensworth, California. Um, one of the co-founders particularly, which happens to be William Payne, who is a Denison University graduate in 1906. We tell this story of William Payne as I want to illustrate what it means to be home or locating a place called home. Often as part of the American nostalgia, we fancy concepts and things of home, a place which, where we can claim as a starting place, some form of identity of our location in America. We often return home as it provides memories, but most, more so, it is our story. It has a beginning and home helps us to place a marker on our beginnings. And this is where this American odyssey begins for the hundreds of black families of Allensworth, California, who unfortunately do not and cannot claim inheritance to a home that their ancestors created for them. In 1908, William Payne, like so many other exodusters who migrated to California, along with the Colonel Allen Allensworth, relocated from Ohio as a teacher to California seeking greater opportunities. Following in the footsteps of Booker T. Washington, who encouraged many other African-Americans who were fleeing the South, but also building on Booker T. Washington's notion of comeuppance, but also building and having self-reliance for Black people in America. Booker T. Washington, who also founded Tuskegee Institute, now known as Tuskegee University, encouraged many Black Americans to go West. California would be the new odyssey for so many who were seeking refuge, a safe place, a haven, a place to call home. Following this, William Payne took his family and his two little daughters, his wife and his two daughters, to California seeking opportunities as a teacher. He arrives in 1908 in California, in 1906, I'm sorry, in California, and there, when he applies to become a teacher in the state of California, they deny him a teaching license. We all understood that the, the tentacles of Jim Crow South had unfortunately made its way west. And this is where the story begins for William Payne and the Colonel. And in 1908, inspired again by the message and the economic self-sufficiency of Booker T. Washington, Colonel Allen Allensworth of Kentucky one of the most distinguished black men in the U.S. Army, along with Ohio educator William Payne, these two men set out to establish a town where, quote, African-Americans would settle upon the bare desert and cause it to blossom as a rose, unquote. The American dream was within reach for them. They had beaten the odds against the ills of reconstruction, Jim Crow, and segregation by migrating from the Midwest to California to build a home. And I wanna read something very briefly from Alan Allensworth, which is why I think this is more crucial and more important to this testimony and this story. In 1908, with William Payne and, Co and Colonel Alan Allensworth decided to co-found the town of Allensworth, Colonel Allensworth was so excited, he wrote to Booker T. Washington the following letter, and I quoted at length. He states, I take great pleasure in informing you that I have just completed an organization to be known as the California Colony and Home Promoting Association. The object of this association is to unite with you in creating favorable sentiment for the race. One of the chief purposes of this association will be to mold public opinion favorable to intellectual and industrial liberty. To this end, I have secured over 9,000 acres of the richest land in Central California, where the colony will be located on the main line of the Santa Fe Railroad. A town will be established upon the most scientific bases and improved methods of a city and of buildings. As it is just as cheap to build right as wrong, we will commence with the ownership of public utilities, we intend to demonstrate to the world that we can be and do, thus meeting the expectation of our friends 
and to encourage our people to develop the best there is in them under the most favorable conditions of mind and body. This we have in California, as you are aware. It is my desire to have our streets given names of historical and educational value. And in the midst of this city, we will have a lake surrounded by a park to be named, if you have no objection, Washington Park, in honor of the greatest Negro sentiment maker in the world. Have you no objection? Respectfully yours, Alan Allensworth. Now, of course, Booker T. Washington turned down something like that, right? Who would want not want to have a park named after them? Um, and particularly someone who was one of the most critical voices of African-Americans and come up as during our time. However, the story would take a tragic turn once settlers began settling within Allensworth. But let's talk about the glory moments of Allensworth. The town which served as a transfer point on the Santa Fe Railroad, it was the only um, transfer point from Los Angeles going to Fresno, going towards the Bakersfield, went up towards to, um, um, to um, Oakland. Travelers would stop, transfer, and visit Allensburg, purchasing goods and services in the town. Allensburg was anchored by over 800 acres devoted to cultivating sugar, wheat, barley, cotton, and poultry, and that was sold to neighboring towns along the Santa Fe Railroad. The sound of the colony would soon become a depot for grain, for cattle merchants, and those who provided a steady stream for business for their hotels, their, their, ho their restaurants, their library stable. And only a year after its founding, they had a post office. Now, here's where the story takes a very unique turn as well. By 1912, Allensworth was made into a voting district and a school district. And with $5,000, around $3,300,000 in today's dollars, they built a two-room public school. And William Payne, who was denied his teaching license when he first arrived in California, would now become the first teacher and principal of the Allensworth School. He had received his teaching license. So they had did exactly what, what Booker T. Washington encouraged them to do. They followed the American dream. They created a colony just for themselves to help preserved not only for themselves, but others to come along after them. So in, in addition to becoming their own independent town, they had a functioning general store, a drug and pharmacy store, a hotel that housed travelers and transient business people. In essence, it was a shining example of black self-sufficiency and prosperity. And unfortunately, that would be its biggest problem. As Allensburg prospered, the town became the target of various different business interests. Now, originally, when they bought the land through their own um, private company from the Pacific Farming Company, the Pacific Farming Company and the Pacific Water Company had promised Allensworth 10 wells, just as they did the other neighboring white towns. Unfortunately, Allensworth only received four wells. Those four wells would not be able to sustain a growing colony that was moving quickly and growing fastly. So they sued the California Farming um, Company as well as the Pacific Water Company in order to regain ownership of those wells, but also to get additional wells. Well, unfortunately, Pacific Water Company did not enact or give them their additional wells, but they did, you know, were sued and they, they, they um, lost the litigation. And they did have to turn over the wells to Allensworth. And unfortunately, this, the town was not able to build enough and sustain itself because they didn't have the adequate filtering pumps and all the other necessary equipment because the Pacific Farming Water Company had not provided them with those resources. Another key element that happened during the time, the Santa Fe Railway. As I mentioned earlier, it was the only stop along the way from Los Angeles to Oakland. Additionally, what happened is that the Santa Fe Railway, they had petitioned the, 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 the colony members of Allensworth, is it possible that we can hire Santa Fe Railway any black persons because at that time they had not any black persons working on the Santa Fe Railway. And Allensworth was the most popular stop 
So they asked if they can hire someone to drive that line, or at least hire someone black to be a ticket agent to take tickets at Allensworth. Santa Fe Railway denied that request. But what they did do is they built another depot stop in Alpaw, the neighboring white town. And with that, the trains began to divert all services, preventing any economic continuance of self-sustaining sustainability at Allensworth, moving all of its businesses to Alpaw. That would decimate the community of Allensworth. So denying the town to access to water, which was critical, and the water table, it continued to decline, and a more developed water supply would have been necessary to sustain this town. And unfortunately, because of the Pacific Farming Company failures to dig necessary wells to provide other essential infrastructure improvements, the citizens of Allensworth, unfortunately, did not have the wherewithal for their farmers and agricultural sustainability to help the town continue to grow. With the Santa Fe Railroad continuing to divert its trains from Allensworth to Alpaw, it also decimated the community's economic sustainability. And this is one of the other critical components is unfortunately in 1919, the Colonel himself was walking in the streets on a business trip in Los Angeles, California, and was struck and killed by a motorcyclist. It was discovered that the motorcyclists were two white men who had struck the Colonel. They don't know what the charges were or I mean, if any charges could be found, um, if it was malicious intent, but unfortunately the Colonel would die the next day of his injuries. What does this mean when we talk about home? Home for those who were in a community living the American dream. Just as sure the black communities of Tulsa, Oklahoma and Rosewood, Florida, and those who massacred those communities by white mobs who were angered by black thriving and success and achievement, Allensworth unfortunately suffered their fate through the destructive practices in a systemic manner, economically and of infrastructure through the transportation industry. How do we reconciliate and help those who have moved on, the descendants who are still living, many of them in the California area, who are seeking some type of sustainability to remind themselves of the community of their forefathers and their foremothers who created a place called home that you know of as Allensworth. When we think of reparations, we think of those who have been disproportionately economically, judiciously, and politically disenfranchised by a system based on race, culture, and other markers which deem them inferior. Those persons in Allensworth were displaced from their land, a land that they bought legally and with hard-earned money. Although, unfortunately, through racist and implicit biases based on race, it does not mean that it's a, a, a it does not mean that it is a forfeiture of their land, but what it does mean in today's terms is a reclamation, a returning, a sojourn to those and the descendants of Allensford. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Terrence Dean, uh, for that um, moving, informative expert testimony. So now it is two o'clock and we have 20 minutes reserved for questions and comments from our task force members to our esteemed panelists. So at this time, um, would a task force member like to be recognized to share a comment or question? Uh, member Reggie Jones-Sawyer, you are recognized. So um, uh, th th this was very good and I, and I actually I wanna kind of point out with Mr. Austin, uh, Mr. Austin, uh, because of uh, your family and your family's yeah. courage, to, uh, and your courage to come forward, uh, <clears throat> Assembly Member Chris Holden brought forth uh, AB Assembly Bill 948, 
which will require the Bureau of California Real Estate Appraisers to gather data on demographic uh, information of buyers and sellers of real estate property and to compile a data base of homeowners from protected classes who file complaints based on low appraisals. The legislation also requires appraisers to take anti-bias training when renewing their license. Um, I mentioned that because this is this bill was actually signed into law, and it's because of your family and being lowballed by nearly five hundred thousand dollars was the impetus for this legislation. And so it, I also want to just show how legislation can also help. And when we start looking at reparations and turning things around, and you're a perfect example, um, especially with your compelling story, of how we can also use legislation to 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 turn a lot of this around. And so I just want to make sure um, we commend you and your family for for stepping forward um, and having the ingenuity to do what you did, um, because I think at the end of the day, and I think I know. It will help a lot of families who are in similar situations. So, so thank you. Thank you, Member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Member Javon Scott Lewis, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Moore. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists uh, for their presentations. Um, you know, as much as this has. Uh, you know, been meant to be, you know, a discussion on, on the wealth gap. What what this panel presented was a very clear and beautiful and intentionally poetic. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Ward, for helping us to realize the importance of placemaking in this entire process. And so when we're thinking about home, right, when we're thinking about the kinds of attachments that Black people have had to make and remake in this country's history, what we're seeing you know, across today's presentations are the cost of that process. And there is, <clears throat> um, I don't know, I can't see him any longer, um, but uh, Professor Kramer is, is in, I don't know if he's still here, but I don't see him on my, on my screen. So what, what Professor Kramer has added to, you know, to that, oh, there you are, you know, okay, okay. <laughs> You're coming back to us. Um, so what you've helped to add um, is the quantification, right? of that of that investment. And so, you know, I have I guess a couple of questions. Um which which is, you know, how do we think about how do we think about the the migration, right? How do we think about the the impulse, the need to migrate as a kind of economic cost and the the idea of African Americans continued resettlement. Right through that through that migratory process uh, within within your your calculations, uh, Dr. Kramer. Right. So again, right, we're 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 seeing a history here, right? And I love the fact that you call it the startup capital because you're using language that I think you know our our contemporary moment demands and can easily recognize. But if we're thinking about the investments that African Americans made in the Southern Plantation economies, right? And you know, Mr. Austin talked about his family, right, migrating over over to, to California, right, working in the shipyard. So we're thinking again about these investments that are being made in these burgeoning industries, even here in the West. Then what we're seeing, right, is this parallel chart charting, right, of the investment into industry alongside this really important process of emplacement. And then when the industries erode. <laughs> Right again, once the once the plantation economies eroded, right through emancipation, through reconstruction, and ultimately the failure of reconstruction failed to guarantee a promise of home for for blacks in the south. They migrate for other opportunities, right, to various places. Um, you know that Dr. Dean really did a wonderful job through the Exodusta movement, etc. But I'm trying to get a sense of here is how do we think about the relationship between what feels like a very hard economic you know investment um in these various industries alongside the more intimate attachments to the places that black communities invest in because i think when we're when we're trying to understand reparations um we're thinking about the input and the output right in an earlier panel we talked about how um 
some of the, I think it was actually yesterday, right? How, how black people are facing both ends of the kind of, you know, the issue of environmental racism, right? Meaning they are, they are facing the dispossession, the displacement, right? As a result of the industries that are polluting the neighborhoods, they are also there, you know, with their labors contributing to the rise of those industries. So we're seeing this in multiple ways. In other words, we're seeing the same relationship show up as a kind of pattern. And so I want to kind of think about that, right, in a way that that responds to, you know, what Kavan showed us today, right, what, what Paul has showed us today, which are these intimate investments. I don't want us to just get lost in the numbers, but I want us to kind of use the numbers to try and help to respond to right, the kind of lived experiences and the investments that are made are kind of across the board. So it's really a, 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 a comment, right? There isn't an answer that I'm asking for, for any of you to, um, to provide for me, but I, I just wanna try and, and, and point to and, 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 and bring some significance to the relationship between these things, right? Again, the hard economic inputs and outputs of black labor and migration, but also, right, the more intimate costs that are you know related to that migration um because then we see this again showing up with 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 gentrification with more with more immediate kinds of of dispossessions um that that are a part of this really long right history of incorporation when it is opportune and expulsion when it is opportune right and so i want us to kind of think about that relationship throughout because i've now seen a, a very clear pattern across really several of our of our of our panels Thank you. Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Madam Chair, members of our task force, again, thank you, the staff and your leadership for bringing such um, knowledgeable, expert and I would guess humane presentations. And what I want to advance further is from the testimony that we just heard regarding Alan's worth and these assessors devaluing that which we own. In a deeper sense, this oppression, this brutality against our humanity has denied us the human right to have a sense of place, of place. It has rendered us and invisible people. How so? Number one, the destruction of Allensworth, a community that was created in order that we would be able to excel in spite of the hellishness of oppression, of segregation and insult. Yes, it was public policy that destroyed it. Then we have the redevelopment agencies that through public policy pushed us out and said, you will not have a watering hole. You will not have a meeting place, a place. Going back in history, Thank God for the Jewish community that pushed for its place. And of course, Palestinians deserve their place too. But the point I'm making is that at the base of Judaism, it's, 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 it's Zion. It's, it's the Holy Land that we call it. Not much real estate on about I guess, as far as from here to Sacramento and down to Santa Ray, Santa, Monterey, excuse me. But it's about a place. And these areas where we have lost our place, 
the Fillmore, the Harlem of the West. We should have ours too. As the sister said, mama may have, papa may have, but God bless the child has got his own. The Japanese communities went through their pain that was wrong. And in San Francisco, there's Japantown. There's also Chinatown. There's also Little Italy. But black folks are the only ones who through public policy, even though we have through ingenuity and skill and having pit bulldog determination have created the Rosewoods, Greenwood, and the Fillmore. But it was through this public policy and public actions that destroyed our sense of place and humanity. That's what's done a lot of psychological injury and pain to black folks. Yes, we know how to be world citizens. We know how to reach out to others, but to deny us again, even after the hellish moments of slavery, enslavement, a place. Therefore, we ought to call for the revitalizations of all of these places that became our sense of place, our watering hole. And that includes Allensworth, the Fillmore, and down in Los Angeles. You know what I'm talking about. I hope we will fight that battle and make sure we have not only our individual real estate through correcting these restricted covenants and the pain that they cause, but making sure that we fight for our place. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. Um, oh, Member Holder, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, I, I do want to echo the sentiments of my fellow members. I think one of the through lines in all of these presentations has been so much about how, even though as black people, we've been destabilized, there have been concerted efforts to disenfranchise us. Through it all, we retain our agency ingenuity and we push back. I mean, the story that Professor Dean told us about Allensworth, that is a story in many ways of triumph, of pushing back. Um, you know, what uh, Miss Ward talked about and the way that she presented um, the, the, the story of, of, of Bruce's Beach, and ending with that incredibly powerful mic, drop the mic moment poetry. You know, that is us as a people pushing back against these constant forces that continue to destabilize us. You know, um, you know the, the speaker who presented on his own personal experience of, you know, being, being completely alienated, alienated in this housing industry. You know, where they're literally trying to take all his equity, his hard earned equity away. He fought back. He showed agency and fought back against this system that is bombarding us. Um, so that's the through line that I'm seeing in all of these stories. Now, I want to get to my, to my question for all of you. Um, you know, I think that I think that belonging is something that we are all witnessing in these stories. This, this African Americans, we keep fighting for a sense of belonging in this country, right? And one of the things that this commission has to do, one of our awesome responsibilities, one of many, is to decide who is the community of eligibility. Right? Who should get reparations? And it's going to be a, an ongoing debate about how we 
uh, formulate that. Um, and my, I have concerns about formulating it in a way, in a way that is so narrow that it creates divisions among African Americans and Black people and people in the diaspora, almost all of whom experienced slavery through their ancestry, whether it was in the United States, whether it was in South America, whether it was in Caribbean, in the Caribbean, our, our ancestors were dragged from Africa. Our ancestors were enslaved, whether it was in, whether it was in, you know, in the United States or whether it was in Trinidad or in Haiti or in Brazil. And so, and, and, and moreover, the community of reparations is an international community. It is an international movement. And the thought leaders around the issue of reparations come from uh, all around the globe. And so I'm, a, I, I'm fearful of having a very isolationist perspective on reparations in this process where reparations only goes to a tiny sector of the community who can directly uh, trace and document their uh, descendant, their, their descendancy from uh, uh, African Americans who were enslaved in the United States. I, I have concerns about that very, very narrow construction. My question, particularly to Ms. Ward, because your comments resonated with me, um, is how do you think such a narrow construction around reparations would impact um, the sense of belonging for all, all people of African descent in the United States who, have, who, whether or not they descended directly from a slave who was in the United States, have the experience of enslavement in their past? How do you think limiting the construction around this community of eligibility would impact that larger um, diaspora of Africans in the Americans, in the Americas? I mean, I think it'll, it'll divide us, you know? And I think when we're having this conversation around reparations, it should not be something that divides us. It should be something that brings us together. Um, and I, I just go back to just like what we're experiencing now in this country. It's not, it's not tied to just African Americans. When police pull you over, they don't say, when they pull a Jamaican person over, they don't say, oh, you're Jamaican, so I'm not gonna treat you as harshly as an African American. They don't know the difference. You're still marginalized. And so, I, and that's why I proposed a, a tier, some type of tiered method. I don't know how that would work, but um, something that acknowledges the marginalization that they're experiencing now and that they've experienced since they've been in the United States. Some of them are even born here, you know? So I don't know. I am just not a proponent of, of um, closing it off that way and eliminating it that way either. It's very divisive. Oh, you're on mute, Member Holder. I was wondering if Dr. Dean had a comment on that, Dr. Kramer. Dr. Dean? One of the difficulties and challenges that I, I, I faced, um, like I said, I'm tracing William Payne's um, lineage and history, um, who was a direct descendant of slavery. I was able to find his parents um, who were enslaved in Virginia. Um, and then um, to trace his history. So that's connecting him directly to Allen's work. So I wonder how many others, and we can also connect, you know, the Colonel himself, Colonel Allen Allensworth, who escaped slavery um, himself and um, creates his own town. So he becomes um, a modern day savior for himself, but also a modern day savior of re reimagining um, post-slavery, a land for freedom. And for those of you who are familiar with um, enslaved persons who um, escaped slavery in the South, Maroonage, um, they were called Maroonages, uh, where Black people lived. So we have like the Gullah Geechee Islands, like now we have in South Carolina. So the fact that they would have this forethought to keep creating land for themselves and rebuilding um, in spaces, and now doing it through the, the legitimacy of the state and, and working in cooperation with the state 
but does the state then thus is cooperative with them? What happens to them and their land now? Because that land technically still belongs to those who, you know, found Allensworth and their descendants. It's now owned by the state of California State Parks. <laughs> so, um, but the challenge I'm raising here is too, is how do we um, decide the reparations for those descendants who don't even know they're the descendants? Um, the state park has had a difficult challenge of locating those who lived there at one point because so many of them, once they um, left Allensworth, they did not keep track. There were no tracking um, mechanisms available to know where they went. If they went back to, California, um, to Los Angeles, did they go to Bakersfield? Did they go to Oakland, San Francisco? We don't know where those families went. So the difficulty there would be trying to locate those family members and then also doing the, the necessary work of ensuring that they um, have ownership and, and, and um, access to those reparations connected to slavery and enslavement. But I'm pretty sure their ancestors who were exodusters who were probably migrating from the Midwest as well in the South. So we can definitely find some work with that, but that's gonna take a lot of work, a lot of work. Member Grills, you are recognized. Thank you. I, I realize that we are at or a couple of minutes past time. So I, I'd like to share the questions and ask if there is if it is not if there is not enough time for our um, witnesses uh, to speak to the questions now that perhaps they could get the information uh, to the DOJ staff. So I had a, a, a grills. Yes. I'll just say the next item on our agenda, which is adoption of findings, which is 30 minutes long. That's actually a moot point. Um, we won't be discussing that based on the vote that we took uh, yesterday. And so we do have a bit of time um, left for, for panelists to answer questions if, if the panelists themselves have, you know, 15, 20 minutes to spare. So yes, okay. I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought. Uh, continue with your questions. Thank you so much. And, and Professor Dean, you kind of sort of answered my question, but just in case, and I'll put all three questions out at, at one time. Um, do you have a sense of how many descendants remain in Allensworth and um, are they an organized body? Or are they becoming an organized body um, on their own behalf? And then Professor Kramer, um, in a book, I think it's Fortunes of Africa, if my memory serves me right, um, uh, the author offered a projection of about 228 years on how long it would take to bridge the wealth gap between whites and blacks due to enslavement. This, I believe, is based on um, if nothing were done, mm -hmm. you know, no reparations, no public policies to correct racist de jour or, and de facto practices. So based on your analysis, if nothing were done, how long would it take to achieve just basic uh, wealth um, equity? And then finally for, um, uh, no, two more, I'm sorry, for uh, Ms. Ward, do you have other black families that have had experiences sim similar to the Bruce family um, and that may be seeking redress? So I'm mean, just so that we have a sense how many families are in similar situations that are in the process of beginning their work um, to achieve justice? And then lastly, for um, um, Mr. Austin, uh, has there been any organizing in your neighborhood, community organizing I'm speaking of, uh, resulting in a sense of how many families uh, or how many people may have had a similar experience to yours whether it was through um, um, appraisal processes or um, showing homes or trying to sell homes or blocking the sale of homes. Um, are there specific realty companies that are implicated now? And how much loss um, have families incurred as a result of these kinds of practices? Have, has any organizing happened to try to um, gather that information? I guess I can go first if you want, uh, or uh, would you like to go first, Mr. Kramer? No, go, go ahead. Oh, 
Um, and so in terms of California, there is another family, the Prelu family. They actually own uh, plots of land, a plot of land on Bruce's Beach Park. But because that land is owned by the city of Manhattan Beach, um, we weren't able to do anything for that family. Um, and in terms of nationally, yes, we've got about close to 100 families who have reached out to us and asked for our help. Um, and the first family that we're really focusing advocacy attention on is uh, Winston Willis, this family. He was um, he's out of Cleveland, Ohio. He was a black business owner, owned several properties, over 20 properties um, in Cleveland, Ohio. And the land was essentially take all of his businesses were taken from him and many of them by Cleveland Clinic. So, I mean, this is an epidemic. This is happening nationally. Um, and so, I mean, I can give you more details if you will send you more details if, you, if you'd like, Dr. Grills. But yeah, it's we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Yeah, um, if I may uh, try to answer the question about the um, wealth gap, how long it would take to close without any action being taken. I'm actually afraid, and I don't have the hard data um, to support this, uh, but uh, I, I can certainly do some research on it if you would like me to do that. Um, I'm afraid that it might, might actually grow larger because the wealth gap grew larger through the um, uh, New Deal era and the post-war era. Um, so there is a tendency of um, inheritances that were derived from slavery and are handed down generally in white families to increase exponentially through compound interest. And that those inheritances are missing in the hands of black families. Um, so the gap would tend to grow larger rather than closing by itself. So I think it really takes a, a massive effort like reparations to close it. And that's why I was also arguing, I, I think that Closing the wealth gap should be a minimum first step. Um, and then there are other considerations like that were that were mentioned by several speakers before about um, uh, losses after slavery and um, New Deal era and redlining and uh, the examples of losing um, the, uh, a sense of place and of home. Um, those should be quantified as well. I don't have the expertise to do that, but um, I, I think it's absolutely fair to consider reparations as a, a beginning part of the debate, not as a closing part, not a payment kind of hush money. You know, we, we pay and then we never talk about it again, but rather the beginning of an honest coping with history. And that's how it was in Germany. The reparations were paid beginning in 1952. But the debate about what Germany's past looked like uh, began really in earnest in the 1960s and 70s and 80s when school curricula were changed and, uh, and uh, yeah, so the coping of with history should be, um, should be an ongoing process. Thank you. Uh, no problem. So yes, um, so there has been quite a bit of movement since our story came out um, about our house being, um, you know, just the, the appraisal coming out at such a, 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 a very low number, significantly low at $500,000, that um, the brother Julian Glover from Channel 7 News have been, people have been reaching out to him left and right, wanting to tell their story. So at least know in the Bay Area, he's covered at least seven other stories, but it will take um, a committee to get together to really look at the appraisal business. Um, and so currently there's not, it's, it's like we're right at the beginning. Like the story is just now being told. Um, so I know within our community, no, we have not had an opportunity to, to really galvanize people or people to start looking at their, um, at their loans, looking at their appraisals, comparing them with others. When I say others, I mean white folks that have bought homes in, in the area to really look and see what's going on in this industry that's not serving um, black and brown people correctly. And so hopefully from this, uh, this platform, 
It will give us some legs, give us some momentum, be able to bring in some specialists to really look at what's going on, especially in the Bay Area where I live personally, to really look at seeing why are people um, property, um, especially black folks, why are their property being uh, devalued at such a large and alarming number? Um, so yes, so hopefully this is a catalyst for change, but I do know right now um, it's not that, you know, we don't have a committee of people that can dive into that work. You know, it's gonna take some resources, some experts to really get in and try and, uh, you know, dismantle this system that's not working. Thank you. You know, to Mr. Austin's point, here, I'm in Ohio, um, they have a task force that they created in Ohio um, on um, redlining, the redlining district that has happened um, for a lot of ham families, particularly those who were, um, their appraisals were under appraised. Um, so they're going back and they are um, the state, the county, um, the county's accountant or something like that is, is looking into this. They created a task force. You know, they went back through all the paperwork to see, yes, black families' homes were under appraised. So I raised the question. I said, well, how does the system change? Because he said, well, you know, we're going to put new appraisers out there, you know, um, and so we're trying not to have that practice continue. I said, well, did you? change the system of how these practices have. It doesn't matter if the person is racist or not. If the system has not changed, then they're still enacting the same systems that have already been in place since the 1960s, you know, 70s, when they already undervalued black people's homes. My second question was, are you going to compensate those people for their homes for being undervalued? They hadn't even got to that point yet. They were like, we don't know. <laughs> so, no, and then what are you going to do with the banks? Are the banks going to, how are they going to be taken to, you know, made accountable for all of this um, as well? So, there, so there's a, you know, find a thread that we have to follow here. So I hope that they would do something like that, create a task force in the state of California. We get all these people who are complicit, you know, to, to take ownership and to also, again, you know, um, to, to do some type of um, reconciliation in regards to that. But it's in regards to, um, to Dr. Grill's point and Allensworth, um, the great thing is that a lot of the people who lived at Allensworth at one point were um, upper middle class or middle class um, blacks who, who were of note. So the great thing is we can trace some of their their lineage um, based on their names and in the in the, in the um, industries that they were part of. One was Oscar Over, who was one who was the first black chief justice um, in the state of California. So with that information, yes, we can trace some persons back um, through their industry. Um, again, the colonel himself was a lieutenant in the army, um, so we can trace his lineage. William Payne, you know, obviously he was an educator. We were able to trace his lineage. A lot of the persons who lived in um, Allensworth at that time were of note and um, of great industry in California. So we can trace some of them, um, and, and also farmers, because farmers had to, you know, um, um, identify the, the paperwork through um, the acreage and lands that they had as well. So we can do some of that work um, again, but it's just creating a team. Um, unfortunately, the California State Park shared with me, they don't have the resources to do that type of work. Um, I'm a one-man operation. <laughs> I was able to track down one person, um, as I said, William Payne. Um, but I'll be more than happy to try down more and do more work. Uh, but I think it'd be, but I, I don't think the work is not uh, um, unattainable. It is attainable to achieve. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, member girls. Uh, Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the task force. Um, are we not consider that we have resources right before our noses, and we should not uh, assume that we can't find the record? A case in point: in 2010, when the Third Baptist Church, that historic institution, we were about to celebrate again the typical Easter and Palm Sunday. 
What did I say as pastor? It's all right if you're a Christian or whatever. But have you thought about there is a history of your own people? What did I do? I got some scholars come from Washington, D.C. on Palm Sunday morning and did an African ancestry research program. Went all the way back to Africa and established my roots. Number two, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has the largest bank of family research methodology in the world. Number three, they just reached out to the National NAACP after a conversation of two and a half years and an collaborative experience was established and they committed as a church $12.5 million to the NACP to do several initiatives but the one that I'm not being self-serving I'm just talking about what I'm talking about they also established a Dr. Amos C. Brown scholars program and in that program, this coming 2022, we will take a minimum of 50 young people to Ghana, West Africa. It's paid by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a quarter of a million dollars, who will go there and see ground zero of this evil, this brutal Atlantic slave trade. And they will come back as ambassadors for racial reconciliation and social justice. Young people from high school, college, and seminary. So we can, we can do it. And there are records that are available. So I think we need to get it out of our minds that we can't search. And particularly with the Freedmen's Bureau records being brought on. What does this do in the process? Help us as a people to have rituals of remembrances. We don't need to be shortchanging ourselves by having African American History Month. Or we used to be African American History Week. And let me say something else real quick. Many of us don't know that Carter G. Woodson was not the first great black historian. It was a man named the Reverend George Washington Williams, who pastored, by the way, the same church, Union Baptist of Cincinnati, Ohio, that Colonel Allen's work pastor too. And the first black pastor of Third Baptist Church, Charles Satchel, the great grandfather of Shirley Graham, W.B. Du Bois' wife. He came over the Oregon Trail in 1856. I'm, I'm citing all this to say, there's a whole lot of stuff that's around. All we got to do, just claim it and not assume that we can't get the records. We can, if we have the will and the support of others who see the vision. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. So I realize it's 2.40 and I wanna be respectful of the time for the panelists. I did have two questions that I wanted to pose um, and then I'll leave it up to uh, other task force members in the event they have any last questions for the panelists. So for Dr. Kramer, um, I don't remember who it was um, that called via public comment this morning, but I did make note of the question. And you know, you already kind of spoke to it in your presentation, but the question was, um, what is reparations 
and um, how do you think it could be distributed? And then also in your statement, could you speak to um, you know the conversation that we seem to be having right now around the community of eligibility? Um, and if your work with you know Kristen Mullen or Sandy Darity has informed um, who you think um, be eligible for reparations in the state? And thank you I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Should I go ahead? Great. Thank yes. you for that question. It was Cherise Cryer this morning in the in the public comments phase. Um, oh, yes, and yes. Um, I noticed her questions with some trepidation because this is a minefield that I'm very reluctant to enter, um, especially since I'm not part of the descendant community. And I think that the question who should be eligible and what reparations should be, so the modalities, that should be really determined by the de descendant community, uh, not by uh, by myself. But what I can offer is some personal opinions that I would at, at the same time ask the task force to disregard, <laughs> um, if I can do that. Um, so um, the eligibility criteria, I am through my collaboration with uh, Professor Darity and Kirsten Mullen, um, I'm very um, familiar with their uh, definition of, you know, 12 years defining as uh, African American on, pu on public documents, like in the census, and uh, having an, an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. Um, to me, that seems um, fair because it is the group that was mostly ignored by previous attempts at uh, racial justice uh, policies. Um, and uh, as, you know, as was sometimes said in the debate, I, I listened to it yesterday with great interest. Um, other groups could be, could take this as a precedent and then claim their own reparations cases. So I don't necessarily find it divisive to uh, to uh, look at the ADOS definition. Um, but again, I don't think that's my place to make any recommendations. So this is just a personal opinion that I'm, I, I invite you to disregard. Regarding the modalities, you know, what reparations should be, um, I guess I would consider, I would offer this consideration to look at precedents for, for reparations. And one case that I'm thinking about is Japanese American World War II internet reparations, which were paid in the form of a check and a letter of apology to each of the eligible respondents. Um, and there is more precedent, uh, for example, for slavery re reparations actually, under the wrong heading where actually slave, uh, slave owners received reparations for the abolition of slavery. And these slave owners received cash payments, including from the federal government of the United States when slavery was abolished in the District of Columbia during the Civil War. They received $300 per enslaved person um, and um, that was paid out of the if I understand it correctly, out of the regular budget um, of the United States at the height of the Civil War when every penny counted for the defense of the Union. I find that remarkable. And there, I, I checked a number of cases, uh, like uh, almost 149 or 50 cases of countries that largely paid reparations to slave owners, um, and some did it through taking large loans and paying them off over centuries, like Great Britain or France or Haiti did, and um, um, others gave out bonds and so on. There is various constructions, but there is precedence for this so that I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Um, so with this, I'll, I'll shut up and um, I invite you to disregard my, my personal opinions on these matters. Well, thank you, Dr. Kramer. Um, thank you for that. So I had a follow-up question. Um, it's for Kavon Ward. So in the and this is a question specifically about Bruce speech. So um, under international law, right, there's five forms of reparations. There's compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. So in the specific context of Bruce speech, right, um, 
the Bruce family received reparations in the form of restitution from LA County, right? Not necessarily Manhattan Beach. And you said in your opening remarks, right? Manhattan Beach hasn't really fully atoned, if at all, for what they did to the Bruce family. Um, so again, going back to my original point, right? The Bruce family received their land back. So under international law, that is a form of reparations under uh, the form of restitution. However, international law you know, requires for reparations to be fully comprehensive, uh, reparations should come in all five of those forms. Um, it should come in the form of restitution, which accounts for stolen land and stolen wealth, stolen intellectual property, you name it. But it should also account for reparations in the form of compensation, which is money. Uh, rehabilitation, which accounts for mental damage or mental harm. Satisfaction, which account, which would mean like a, a full and comprehensive apology of some sort from the institutions or entities involved. And then guarantees of non-repetition, which is a guarantee from the, 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 har the, the, harm, the entity that harmed um, that they were guaranteed to not um, harm the victim group in the future. So, um, you know, I understand you're not necessarily a representative for the Bruce family, but you have worked intimately uh, with them. Um, I was at the, um, the ceremony and I saw Senator Bradford speak and I saw you speak and it was great. Um, and so I'm curious to know in your conversations with the Bruce family, if you can share, um, do they have this notion um, that there should be more, that they should be given um, not only, you know, just the, their land back, but maybe those other forms of, of reparations as well, accounting for, you know, like I said, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees upon repetition. Absolutely. From I think LA County and or, excuse me, from LA County and or Manhattan Beach and or the state at large, because there's a lot of different entities in play. Uh, absolutely. I think I spoke to this in my remarks. They are definitely looking for solution in the form of compensation uh, for lost business enterprise, for violation of human and civil rights. Um, and I, I think the expectation comes, that expectation comes from the city of Manhattan Beach. I think that the county has done um, what they could all they could have done in terms of giving the land back to the family or agreeing to restore the land back to the family but now it's the responsibility of the city to do its part um i in terms of what the expectation or if there is an expectation of the state of california to do anything you would have to ask them that i'm not sure but i know that they are looking for the city to to pay restitution to compensate them And I'd also add that, you know, I'd also add that you know, there's a lot of conversation going on about like the, this definition of what reparations is, right? And a lot of people um, tend to monetize it more than anything and, and don't like to call land restoration reparations. Um, but I am of the belief that reparations is anything that you provide to repair the damage done. And so for me, this is reparations. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that breaking it down to, to me, it's like, for me, it's not so much restitution, it's restoration, it's reparations, but in the form of land restoration. Um, and so when we say, we exist, just for speech exists to, to get restoration and restitution for the family. We are not looking at the restoration of the land as restitution. We're looking at compensation as restitution. And if I may add, which I think is, is excellent and an excellent question, which is why I was very intentional around saying reconciliation, reconcile, because I think that plays a huge part in this conversation as well when we talk about reparations. Um, if you look at Brian Stevenson and what he did in Alabama, the reconcil truth and reconciliation, reconciliation um, form that he did with um, those who were um, 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 lynched um, during the period of lynching. Um, but also, I was thinking about South Africa and, um, and um, Nelson Mandela, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, and their work around reconciliation of restoring back to those who were victimized 
during apartheid, um, and also the land and all of those other things, how to restore people back and make them whole again. Those who um, exploit it um, and made use of um, the exploitation, how do they reconcile? Like the, the, the onerous is back on them, the forgiveness. Uh, so a public apology or apology to the individual themselves. So that's why I use the term reconciliation and reconcile. Thank you for that, Dr. Dean and uh, Ms. Ward. Are there any other uh, uh, questions or comments from the task force members on recognizing our time? Well, thank you um, again to our esteemed panelists, uh, particularly thank you, Mr. Austin, uh, Mr. Ward, Professor Kramer, uh, Professor uh, Dean. Uh, this was absolutely um, outstanding and we truly, truly appreciate um, the testimony that you all provided us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, I do appreciate being here. Absolutely, thank you. So it is now a 2.52. And um, again, just to make an announcement, agenda item number 17, which was supposed to be an action item, adoption of findings, which was supposed to run from 2.30 to 3 p.m. is, um, we're no longer gonna discuss that. Uh, it's a moot um, action item because we took action on um, um, this yesterday. Um, and so that is no longer um, an item of discussion or action today. So we will move forward to agenda item number 18, uh, which is an action item agenda for the December hearing. So at this time, I would um, ask a request for the staff, um, if could you kindly um, place on the screen uh, the tentative agenda um, that staff prepared uh, for the December hearing. And as we're waiting for staff to put on the screen um, that agenda, um, I just wanna remind members of the task force um, um, of that agenda. Um, also remind members of the task force that, um, you know, the public pro agenda proposal that, sorry, the public hearing proposal that we adopted was a tentative public hearing proposal with the caveat or notion that it can be amended by task force members at any time. So um, again, as we're waiting for staff to pull up that um, document, I just wanna remind uh, members of the public and the task force that our next meeting is scheduled to occur December 8th and 9th. Um, when we voted on the on the agenda, um, we decided that day one, so December eighth, we would discover uh, we would talk about issues related to infrastructure, gentrification, homelessness, and public health. And then day two would be reserved to topics surrounding entertainment, arts, sports, and culture. Um, okay, great. And so if we can get a like um a, a side by side to see two two of uh two pages at once, that would be great. If not, that is okay as well. Um but something that I well before I before I get to that, um I just want to say for the for these next 30 minutes as a task force, um we're putting out there um who we may want to bring in and invite as panelists for uh, the next hearing, um, what additional topics, if any, that we want to include. Um, um, do we want to change up entirely um, the topics for the next meeting? Um, those are some of the three things. So again, you know, we're at this the next 30 minutes or so. You know, we're facilitating a discussion among the members about any adjustments to the hearing topics, feedback on potential witnesses, and additional topics for consideration by the task force. Now, in looking at the agenda, I realized that staff placed the hearing on the panel on entertainment, arts, and culture as just one panel. So. It appears that day uh, day one is going to be talking about 
gentrification and homelessness and infrastructure, then day two, there's a, a conversation on public health. And then the second panel and the last panel of the day on day two is about entertainment, arts, and culture. And so I was wondering in terms of the pre-planning, um, was that because you know we anticipate that we may not be able to get some very high profile names for the full day if we if we allow for the entertainment, arts, sports, and media section to be a full day? But I, I I think that we should have gentrification, infrastructure, home assistance, public health in one day, and the entertainment, arts, media, and sports in another day. But um, I'm, I'd be interested in hearing from other task force members what they think about that. Um, or do you think it should stay as is with us having like one hour and 30 minutes to talk about entertainment, arts, and culture on the second day? Uh, member girls, you're recognized. So, Mark, um, I'm not so sure about the entertainment, um, arts, and sports, and I'm actually less inclined to want to hear from like popular figures in entertainment, but more from folks who are actually involved in trying to address the many forms of racism that are manifesting themselves, for example, in, in film and television and production processes, et cetera. But I, before even getting to that, I, I'm, I'm unclear about what is being captured under the category on day one of public health, because I'm, I don't see physical health and mental health reflected anywhere in our uh, list of topics over the course of the next year and a half, um, and, and medicine and mental health are not the same as public health. And I know that for, um, I think it's the meeting number eight in um, August, September, 2022, day two has a mental health psychological harm listed, but I think that's within the context of looking at reparation in the forms of what they, what's restitution and rehabilitation. So that's not necessarily the same thing. So could someone clarify for me what is under the category of public health? And if it, it does not include mental health and um, medical issues, um, then I think we've left a gaping hole in um, our topics of coverage. If it is being included, then I still have a challenge because that's not going to be enough time to cover three incredibly dense and serious issues with lots of findings waiting to be had. Uh, Chair, if I could be recognized. Go ahead, Member Holder. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Girls, I absolutely agree with you. I think with all of the recent studies coming out about tremendous amounts of bias in the field of medicine and the terrible outcomes that it is having in terms of infant mortality for black babies, you know, um, mortality for black mothers, birthing mothers, um, tremendous disparities in life expectancy and, you know, studies about how medical students, current medical students, 50% of them believe that African Americans have thicker skin than, than, uh, non-African Americans and, and how that is impacting, uh, the type of medical treatment that African Americans as a community are receiving from doctors and future doctors. So I think we're seeing the most grotesque disparities and the, the most ardent implicit bias bubbling up in the field of medicine. I think we need a day just to talk about medicine and mental health. 